Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Althoff. I am a public relations specialist here at Loggers, and I'd like to welcome you to our today's webinar, Loggers 101, a review of the basics. Uh, this webinar is designed to give you a general overview of who Loggers is and the benefits that we provide our members. So we're going to keep it pretty high level today. We're going to just hit on a lot of the basics. If you are the person at your employer who handles the administration of, of loggers um, and the month-to-month -month reporting, I would also encourage you to attend, if you haven't already, our Eclipse Review that is hosted by Jeff Kemker, our Manager of Member Services. And that is going to get um, into a lot more detail about um, reporting, um, what to report and how to report it, um, all your different sorts of military and workers comp um, and, and those sorts of um, issues that you um, may deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you haven't already, I'd also encourage you to attend that. Registration is available on our website. Um, also, be looking for in the coming months um, some new webinars we have plans to um, host. Um, these webinars are going to look at more specific topics. I know I get a lot of questions at this particular um, webinar about payout options and retirement processes, so we, we do have something in the works um, to address those needs that you have communicated uh, to us that you would like to hear more about. So do be looking for those as, as well. Um, just a few housekeeping things before we get started here with our, our 101 today. Um, at any time during the presentation, if you have questions that you would like to ask me, um, feel free to type those um, and send those to me using your, your GoToMeeting toolbox. I will do my best to respond if I feel like it's something that uh, will benefit the whole group as, as we go through the presentation. If it's something that's a little more specific, um, you can hang around afterwards and I will try and answer you, um, or I will get back with you um, shortly following the presentation, either via email or phone call. So at any time, if you have questions, please feel free to, to type those in your, your toolbox. Um, a copy of this presentation is also available online, so you can go back and, and, and reference these slides later if that is something that you would um, find useful. So with that being said, I want to go ahead and get started here this afternoon. And I kind of always like to start the 101 um, with just a little bit about who Loggers is. Um, we are a non-for-profit public pension system created in 1967 by the General Assembly, and our statutory purpose is to provide retirement, survivor, and disability benefits to our members. So that's all that we do. Um, and like I said, we were created by the General Assembly, so everything that we do do, all the benefits that your employer has elected, the different levels um, and how we calculate the benefits, all of that is actually um, written in state law. Our day-to-day -day governance is done by a seven-member board of trustees. And the neat thing about our board is that they are actually elected. Um, six of the seven members are actually elected by um, loggers members at our annual meeting. Our annual meeting is coming up here in October. Um, and so be looking for more information about that to be available um, all, by email and also on our website very soon. Um, so three of those member trustees are member trustees. And those are folks who are just working and earning a benefit in the system. We have three employer trustees, and those are um, more representatives of each of our uh, member employers across the state. We do have 650 currently, um, and we're, we're growing every month. We have new employers that elect to provide that coverage um, to their employees. Uh, but those employer trustees would be folks like city council members or, or something like that. And then we also have um, a seventh uh, trustee who is appointed by the governor, and that seat is currently uh, sitting vacant. So um, our board of trustees governs our our day-to-day -day functions. Uh, everything else we do is is governed by our state statutes. Um, but the most important thing to remember is that loggers is legally and fiscally separate from the state of Missouri. So what this means is we do follow the laws that govern us, um, but we're not part of the state gov uh, state bureaucracy. I'm not a state employee. Don't work in a state office building. Um, we don't receive any funding from the state. So our members think that that's a really good thing. It really allows us uh, to stay separate from a lot of the politics um, and, and really focus on providing um, the benefits to our members in the, the most efficient and economical way possible. So, 
I'm going to switch gears here a little bit and want to talk before we actually look at the benefit that we provide. Um, I like to talk about number one, who is eligible for loggers coverage, um, and then what all of those folks that work at your employer who are eligible for logger, loggers coverage, what they have to do individually to become eligible to receive their loggers benefit. So I want to talk about those two things first, and then we'll switch gears and actually talk about the benefits um, that we do provide uh, for our members. Uh, so the first thing we have to talk about when each of our um, employers joins, and like I said, we have 650 um, members across the state, each of them individually elected to participate in loggers membership through the membership process. And when they went through that process initially, they elected which departments that they wanted to cover um, um, and offer a loggers benefit to. Now for loggers purposes, uh, we have three departments. We have general department, police, and fire department. And the way we define our police and fire is if you have to be a uniformed officer. So, um, for example, if you're part of a fire department, but maybe you're just in dispatch, you're not actually a firefighter, for loggers purposes, we're going to consider those folks journal employees. So we split um, all of our employees up into those three groups. I know for some of you, you may just have one department. For others, if you're a city, you may have a parks department or a streets department. Um, and for loggers purposes, all those folks are going to be considered general employees. So when your employer joined, they elected to provide coverage to a combination of, of one of these. Um, they would have elected either to provide just for general employees, um, to your general and police department, uh, to your general and fire department, or they could have chose to um, provide coverage to all three. And again, you may not have all three. Um, so at, at any rate, the most important thing to remember is at the bare minimum, our employers all have to cover their general employees. If you have police and fire departments, um, you have the option to add those later. Um, once an employer elects to cover a department, they can never terminate uh, coverage in that department. But let's say you just have a general department, or you are covering your general department, and you have a police department, or you have a fire department, or both. You can always opt to add coverage to those departments later if that's um, ever something you would like to do. So within the departments that your employer has elected to cover, um, all full-time employees within those departments are required to participate in loggers. Um, now, how we define full-time is, is kind of different for everybody, but for loggers purposes, your governing body um, at each of your individual employers chose how they were going to define full-time. The three options that they chose from oops, were either 1,500, 1,250, or 1,000 hours annually. So let's just say, for example, I work at an employer who chose 1,500 hours annually. Um, if I'm working there, that comes out to somewhere around 28 and a half hours a week. So if my job requires me to be working around that every week to where each year on an annual basis I'm working at or above the 1,500 hours, um, then I would be required to be reported um, as a loggers member. I, I don't have the option to opt in or out. If I'm working the full-time hours, um, I, I am required to participate. So each employer, again, gets to elect which of these three options they want to choose. This is one of only a couple options that can never be changed. So once your employer sets their, their hours for full-time coverage, um, that can never be changed. If you don't know what you have currently, um, there's a couple ways you can find out. The easiest way would be um, if, if you have access to Eclipse from the employer side, you can get on there and look. Um, you can also call our office and we'd be happy to provide that information for you if you, if you don't have that uh, readily available. Now, um, members of governing bodies also may individually choose to participate in loggers, so individually choose if they want to or not. And um, in order for them to be able to make that decision, they do have to at least um, be in an employer who has at least 10 covered employees, so 10 loggers eligible employees. And their wages also have to be subject to Social Security withholding. So a lot of times folks of governing bodies may not be working those annual hours for coverage, but there is an option here if they do choose um, to want to participate in loggers as well. 
any elected officials who are working the full-time hours then must, must be covered. And I know we have a couple counties with us on the line today for, for those folks. Um, your part-time county officials can also um, individually elect to participate if your commission uh, allows them to do so. So that's, that's another option that, that you have available to you. There are a few groups of employees who are not eligible for loggers coverage. Uh, the first one would be seasonal. And this would be somebody who maybe does you know, snow removal for you in the winter or lawn care in the summer. Those would be kind of examples of, of these sorts of folks where, um, you know, around here I'm from Jeff City. We've had a really wet summer. Uh, the grass is still green even though we're in August. Um, and so, you know, folks that have been having to maintain lawns probably have been working pretty long hours this summer. Um, they may be working above that 20 and a half hours a week. Um, if I was at, with an employer who had the 1,500 hours um, for you know, three months out of the year. Um, but if they're truly a seasonal employee and that job isn't, isn't happening over the course of the entire year, um, then these folks would not be eligible for loggers coverage. True contractual employees are also excluded from loggers coverage. And then finally, part-time. And so part-time, again, we're going to go back and look at that benchmark um, for annual hours work. So if you're working below the benchmark, you're not eligible for loggers coverage. Even if you want to participate, um, state law does not allow part-time employees um, to be covered. For the folks who work in a covered department and are meeting the annual hours required for coverage, so all of our full-time uh, folks, there are two things that they have to individually do in order to be eligible to receive a monthly benefit from loggers when, they, when they're ready to retire. Uh, the first thing they need to do is they need to become vested. And vesting is just a fancy word saying we require our members to work for 60 months or five years in the logger system. Now, again, remember we do have that 650 some odd employers across the state of Missouri. We've got cities, counties, special districts, emergency services, all kinds of different employers. And a member can work for any combination of any loggers employer across the state. And all the time that they work um, is, is counted towards that vesting. So I could work two and a half years at City A and then turn right around and go work another two and a half years for the county um, and I'd have my 60 months of service in. And once I'm vested, I'm guaranteed a monthly benefit. So even if we had a member who became vested, was only with their employer for six years and then went and worked in the private sector, they would still be eligible for a monthly benefit if they chose um, to take a monthly benefit when they meet the second eligibility requirement, which is reaching a retirement age. Um, Retirement ages, kind of our blanket age that applies to all of our members, um, are what we call regular or normal retirement. And for general employees, uh, that would be age 60. So once you become vested and you hit that regular retirement age for a general employee, again, 60, um, that individual would be eligible for a full unreduced retirement benefit. Uh, for police and fire employees, that would be age 55. So again, remember with the regular retirement age, as far as who we define as police and fire employees, those are our actual uniformed folks out there um, fighting crime and fighting fires. Uh, if you've got other folks in your police or fire departments that aren't those uniformed um, personnel, they would be considered general employees and have that age 60 retirement age. So just kind of keep that in mind. Now, early retirement is something that each member can individually elect to take, and it gives our members the option, um, if they, they choose to use it, to retire up to five years early of their regular or normal retirement age. Um, and of course, there, there is a, a reduction in the benefit for doing this. Um, taking an early retirement means an employee will receive a reduced benefit, um, and it's half a percent for every month early that they were to retire. So an employee um, who retired the full five years early would take approximately a 30% reduction um, in their benefit to draw that benefit early. Now the important thing to remember about early retirement is that the reduction you take for those benefits is 
permanent. So when you hit your regular retirement age, either 55 or 60, depending on which department you're in, um, that reduction remains. It's, it's a permanent reduction uh, for the lifetime of the benefit. We do have one other uh, retirement age. This is something that your employer must elect to provide, so not everybody is necessarily going to have this. And even if your employer does have this, not every employee will necessarily benefit from this. And that's called the rule of 80. And I've got an example up here I'm going to show you here in just a second on how we actually calculate the rule of 80. Uh, but basically we're going to look at your age and your years of service credit. And when they total the number 80, whatever number that is, it allows you to take your benefit early with no reduction in your monthly benefit. So we're going to look at some examples of that here in just a second. I want to put a couple examples up just to kind of illustrate how this rule of 80 actually does work. Um, just to look at this top example, this is kind of an extreme example. Uh, we have an individual who was hired at age 20, uh, worked for 30 years, and so after 30 years they would be 50 years old, and we take the 30 plus the 50. So this individual at age 50 would be eligible for a full, unreduced, uh, benefit from loggers. So no penalty for taking it at age 50 for this employee. Now I've got a couple other examples up here I always like to point out. Remember I, I said that um, the rule of 80, even if your employer does offer it, may not benefit every employee there. And um, what we really have to look at is an employee's age of hire when they started with that employee to see if um, rule of 80 is going to help them out or not. So let's look at this bottom example here. An individual hired at age 40 who works for 20 years, that would make them 60 years old. And so 60 would be their rule of 80 age because we'll take their 60 years of age plus their 20 years of service. Um, but again, remember, 60 is already their normal retirement age. So they're eligible for full unreduced benefits anyway. So rule of 80 really doesn't help this employee. I get questions a lot, and I actually got a couple um, from folks who registered and, and asked me questions about this uh, before the webinar about, well, what if my rule of 80 age uh, comes out to be 85 or 86? Um, do I have to wait until then to draw my benefit, or do I have to take an, an, a penalty for taking it before my rule of 80 age is? And the answer is absolutely not. As soon as you hit your regular retirement age, so either 60 or 55, depending on which department you work for, you are eligible for full unreduced benefits, okay? So the rule of 80 isn't going to hurt anybody. It can, it can only help. Um, and again, once you hit your, your regular retirement age, you're, you're eligible to begin drawing your benefit um, whenever you, you choose to retire. So anybody hired after age 40 in the general department will actually reach their regular retirement age before the rule of 80 age. And the same would be true in this middle example that I have here. Um, if you work for the police or fire department and your rule of 80 age, um, or I apologize, your regular or normal retirement age is 55. Um, if you were hired at or after age 30, your regular retirement age will be l less than your um, uh, rule of 80 age. So uh, rule of 80 really wouldn't help, wouldn't help in those cases. Switching gears here just a little bit now, we've kind of talked a little bit about eligibility, what employees have to do in order to um, earn their benefits, uh, get to where they're eligible to draw those monthly benefits. And I want to talk a little bit now about the actual benefit that, that our members receive, that our members are working throughout their careers to earn. Um, like we mentioned earlier, loggers is what we would call a defined benefit plan. And the way defined benefit plans work, um, loggers pays a guaranteed amount at retirement based on how long an employee works and how much they make. So we're using um, a formula, and that formula is, is looking at length of service and salary. And based on that formula, and we're going to look at the, the calculation here in just a second, um, but based on those, those 
few factors and also a set of benefits that each employer individually elects. Uh, the benefit that they're receiving is a permanent protected benefit for their lifetime. Um, so we're not looking at an account balance. In other words, we're not looking at how much did the employer pay in or how much did the employee pay in. We're looking at how long did that employee work and what their salary was. Um, the other thing about those defined benefits and the way that the formula works and the benefit is paid is that an, 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 a member can never outlive their benefit. So when an, a member retires from loggers, they start receiving a check from loggers every month based on this formula that we're getting ready to look at. And it doesn't really matter how long they live. They could live 10 years into retirement. They could live 30 years into retirement. They never have that fear that their benefit is going to stop. Um, they'll get their loggers check every month. So it really protects against some of those longevity risks that retirees face. These benefits that we pay, again, remember I said we don't receive any funding from the state. So they are funded completely through employer, employee contributions. And actually about 60% of our funding comes from investment return of the system. As we look at this formula, I'm going to mention this point here later, but my last bullet on this slide is that um, the, the lifetime benefit that our members receive is, is not affected by investment return. And as we look at the, form, the formula and the benefit calculation, you'll see there's nothing in there that says investment return. But it's really good news as far as trying to plan for the future for our members. Uh, they don't have to worry about fluctuations in the market affecting their, their nest egg. They, they know based on how long they work and how much they make, exactly how much they're going to get every month. So let's go ahead and look at that calculation. One thing that I, I love about our, our formula is that it's very simple. Um, every single one of our retirees has the same calculation done. Um, we're going to talk about survivor and disability benefits later. We use the same calculation for those folks too. So it's a very simple formula and it applies to everybody across the board. So we've got three components. Number one is the benefit program. Uh, we're going to talk about the elections that each employer uh, makes here in just a second. Um, but the benefit program is basically the level of benefit you want to provide to your employer. It's a multiplier, and they generally range from 1% to 2%. And we'll look at examples of how those work here in just a second. Our second component of the formula is final average salary. Again. Um, we, we're talking about a benefit that's based on how long an employee works and how much they make. Um, so we're looking at that final average salary. Again, we're going to look at some examples here in just a second, but the gist of it is we're going to look at, depending on what your employer has elected, um, an employee's either highest five or three um, years. So we'll look at how we do those calculations here in just a second. And the third component of the formula is service credit. This is pretty, pretty simple. It's basically how long an employee works. Um, we're looking at a combination of both prior service and membership service, and we'll kind of talk about how we arrive at those numbers here in just a second as well. So again, pretty simple. We're going to take the benefit program your employer elects times how much you make times uh, how long you've worked, and that is the base for the benefit that we provide, that protected monthly benefit that is, that is payable for life. Um, so again, remember, we're not looking at an account balance or anything like that. This formula is really the meat and potatoes of, of loggers and what we do um, as far as the benefits that we provide our members. We talked about this a little bit already. Um, as far as each employer has the option to elect their own set of benefits, we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 different combinations of benefits. And I'm going to kind of go through um, the different categories of uh, um, options that employers can choose to look at. Um, and you always have flexibility to change these benefits um, in the future. We're going to talk about how we're going to do that as well. But each employer that I've got on the line with me today probably has a different combination of benefits than the next, the next employer. So um, you have a lot of flexibility to, to design what benefit works best for you. So I'm going to keep this benefit um, calculation, the formula, up here at the top so you can just kind of keep in mind how each of the components and each of the elections that your employer makes kind of play into that formula because that's obviously important to your employees, um, how it affects the calculation because that's their retirement benefit. So um, the first thing is the benefit program. And again, remember, all the benefit program is is a multiplier. Um, they range from 1% to 2%. 
and obviously the higher the percentage or the higher the multiplier, the greater the monthly benefit uh, that the member is going to receive when they retire. So let's look at um, one here for simplicity's sake and then I'll put the rest of them up here so we can look at them all side by side. Um, the L1 program is our 1% program. This is the lowest program um, that, that we offer. So let's just say, for example, we have an employer with a 1% program. The calculation is going to look something like this. It's going to look like 1% times, and this $2,500 a month is a monthly average, a gross monthly average, um, times 25 years of service. So 1% times the employee's uh, gross monthly salary. Uh, times their years and months of service is going to give us that monthly benefit uh, based uh, for life. Now again, um, keep in mind that when an employee retires, they have lots of different options on how they choose to receive this monthly benefit. They may say, you know what, I want to take all of this every month for as long as I live. They may decide, you know, I don't need all of that every month. Maybe I want to take a lump sum, a partial lump sum up front or maybe I want to ensure that a spouse receives a benefit. Um, again, we are going to have an, another webinar here coming up uh, before too long that talks a lot about the payout options. Um, so if you're interested in that, I would really encourage you to check back. So keep in mind that these are just our, our, our base options um, so you can understand how the calculation works. But let me put up the rest of these benefit program examples. I'm leaving my monthly average salary and my years of service the same in each column, and all I'm manipulating is these benefit programs right here. So again, ranging from 1% to 2%, and as you can see, the L6, which is our 2% program, is going to pay approximately double the benefit of the L1. I think um, when I'm out talking to folks, one of the easiest ways when they're trying to just ballpark how much retirement um, can I expect from my loggers benefit is to take whatever your benefit program is and multiply it by your years of service. So if I've got the L1 and I've worked with my employer for 25 years, 1 times 25 would be 25% of whatever I'm making. Um, whatever my final average salary is, 25% is what my loggers benefit will replace. Um, you know, 2% times 25 years would be 50%. So my monthly benefit would be approximately 50%. I think that's a really simple way of, of kind of just roughly estimating, you know, what, what you can expect from your loggers benefit. Now we also have, um, in addition to our life programs, some additional options that an employer can elect that are called life and temporary. Again, we're still talking about these benefit programs up here, that multiplier. Our life and temporary programs pay a base benefit for life that, again, the member, our, our retiree, can never outlive, um, but it pays an additional temporary benefit um, until age 65. So an employee retires at 60, they're going to get, you know, both of these payments until age 65. And when they hit 65, the temporary benefit goes away, and they get their 625 uh, payable for life. So we have several different options as far as life and temporary programs. I think the most common question I get with the LT programs is, um, you know, I'm going to receive my Social Security starting at 62, or I'm not receiving Social Security until 67. It's, it's how, does these, how do the LTs interact with Social Security? And, and they really don't. Um, I believe the intent of these programs was to kind of help bridge the gap between when a member retires and when they begin to draw Social Security. However, um, if you're not set to draw Social Security until 67, your temporary benefit still goes away at 65. If you're going to take Social Security at 63, you still get your temporary benefit until 65. So they're not related in any way, and I always just kind of like to mention that because um, that is a, a fairly common misconception um, that we have. Okay, so we've looked at our multiplier. The second component of our formula, again, is the final average salary. And the way that, that we do this calculation is we look at a member's either highest consecutive uh, 60 or 36 months um, from their last 10 years or 120 months of employment. Um, whether we choose the three or the five year is going to depend on which your employer elected to choose. Three-year final average salaries tend to yield a slightly higher average. Generally, there's a slightly higher cost for an employer to provide that benefit. Um, but just to kind of show you an example of how we do this, 
Um, when an employee retires, we are going to start from their effective date of retirement. So in this case, we're looking at 2012, and we're going to look back 10 years. And within that 10-year or 120-month window, we're going to pick out either the highest consecutive 60 months or 36 months, three or five years, again, depending on which your employer chose. Now, for most folks, you're earning the most right before you retire, and so these averages are going to be probably close to the end of that 10-year window. Um, a lot of people think it has to be your last three or it has to be your last five years, I mean, it really doesn't necessarily have to be. One thing to keep in mind, um, something that is reportable is overtime. So if you had a few years um, in your 10-year window uh, where you worked a lot of overtime, um, those may cause those wages to be higher than what you're earning at the end of your career. Um, another question, you know, we get a lot as well, you know, I, I decided I needed to slow down um, and I, you know, took a demotion or, or cut back my hours or something um, towards the end of my working years. Um, and, and that affected my, my gross wages. In, in those cases, you know, those folks may find somewhere in the middle of that 10-year window is, is where we pick that average from. So it does have to be consecutive 60 or 36 months, but again, it can be anywhere within that window. Uh, something else I encounter from time to time are folks that have worked for more than one logger's employer. If you worked for, say, employer A for 10 years, and then you went and worked for employer B for another 10 years, we're only looking at the last 10 years of wages to do both benefit calculations. Now, if employer A had the 1% program and employer B had the 2% program, we're going to do two separate calculations. We'll do 10 years at the 1% and 10 years at the 2%, and we'll add them together. As far as the member is concerned, they're getting one check from loggers, but the benefits were earned at different levels, and so we have to do two calculations. But the one thing that doesn't change is that 10-year window, so we wouldn't even be looking at employee A's or employer A's wages um, in that example that I just gave. Okay, so we've looked at our multiplier, and we've looked at our final average salary, and the last piece of the puzzle for our benefit calculation is the service credit component um, of, of this, this formula. So service credit is, is a combination of, of two different types of credit here in the logger's office. Um, we have what's called prior service and membership service, so I kind of want to look at what the difference is between those two. Now, for some of our employers we have on the line today, uh, you have been with us since the beginning, and chances are, um, most certainly, you don't have anybody with prior service anymore. Um, because what prior service is, is let's say we have an employee who's hired at a specific um, point in time, and they work those years before you have loggers um, coverage. At the time the employer joins loggers, the time between then and when that employee was hired, is what we call prior service, okay? So for those of you who've been with us since the late 60s, I would be astounded if you had anybody who was still working with you um, that had any prior service time before you joined loggers. Um, for some of our younger employers, uh, maybe that have just joined within the last uh, year or two or five or 10, you probably have quite a few folks um, who have, have this prior service. And when your employer joined, they elected to provide um, either 100%, 75 50 or 25% of that as credit towards your benefit calculation. Um, we do, from time to time, have an employer where, because they had a, a plan in place already, a prior service is treated a little differently. But in general, um, employers have the, the option to cover one of those, those four options, 175 50 or 25% of that time. Now, from the point when the employer joins loggers going forward, it's pretty straightforward. From the point where they join to when this employer retires, that's what we call membership service. And I think the most important thing to remember about membership service is that every month that a loggers member works and is earning service credit in the logger system, that is a month of service credit counting towards their benefit. So sometimes I run into folks and, and they've counted up to an anniversary date. So I've been with my employer for 29 years and 10 months, and they think they need to make it two more months to get that last year's worth of service credit. 
and they really don't have to. Every month that they work, they're getting service credit. You don't have to work to an anniversary date to get a year's worth of service credit. Um, that person could retire with 29 years and 10 or 11 months of service, and that's exactly how much service their benefit would be based on. So they have those options. Okay, so in an example where we have an employee with both prior service and membership service, um, how we get the total number that we're going to plug into our formula up here is going to depend on how this prior service was elected to be treated by each of your employers. So in this case, this employee had 20 years of prior service. If we were to assume their employer gave them 100% credit for that time, it would mean it was as if that employee had always had loggers coverage. So they get all of their 20 years counted um, plus their 13 years of membership service. So this employee's benefit calculation would be based on 33 years of service. And again, remember, if you've got months, I'm just using round numbers here um, for simplicity's sake. Um, it, it could be 33 years and four months, and that's what we would use. Um, if this employer had, say, elected to cover 50% of prior service, instead of getting 20 years here, they'd only get 10. And so instead of 33 years, uh, they would only have 23 years of service credit. So that can make a difference in, in how the, uh, the benefit is calculated. If you're unsure, again, that information is available on Eclipse or whoever um, at your employer has access to that, you can ask them and they can tell you or you can give the office a call and, and we certainly can provide that information for you as well. I think uh, one of the, maybe the most common question that I get at um, benefits fairs as I travel around the state and um, talk to folks is they'll come up to me and they'll say, Elizabeth, I, I know my retirement is important. I know that I need to be saving for retirement. Um, and I'd, I'd like to kick in an extra, you know, 3% to my loggers. Can I do that? And the short answer is no. Again, remember, we're not looking at account balance when we calculate your benefit. So how much you do or don't pay in is not affecting that monthly benefit in any way. Um, the couple options that members have to increase their loggers benefit um, is number one, to work longer, um, which is never an, an attractive option when, when I uh, tell people that. Um, but number two, some folks may actually have the option to purchase additional service credit. Um, not everybody's going to be eligible to do this, but I kind of just want to make note of this. So those folks who maybe are eligible to do this have something to think about. Um, the first group of folks who might be eligible to purchase some additional service will be um, folks with military service. Um, you do have to be an active loggers member in order to be eligible to do this, and you can purchase up to four years of your active military service towards your loggers benefit. Okay? Um, we have a form available on our website if this is something that you're interested in doing and getting an estimate to see what it would cost. Um, but up to four years of that military time can also be purchased towards your loggers benefit. Even if you're going to receive a pension uh, from the military, um, you're still eligible to purchase that time. The other option that some folks may have, for somebody who has had previous non-federal um, public employment in the state of Missouri, uh, any time where they were either not covered under a retirement plan or didn't become vested in that plan, any of that time can also be purchased towards their loggers benefit. So, you know, around here, like I said, I'm, I'm out of Jeff City. We have a lot of uh, state workers around here. Um, state workers participate in a system very similar to Mosier, or to loggers called Mosiers. Um, and if there was an employee who worked, um, say, for the state for four years and they didn't become vested in, in their defined benefit, and then they came and worked for a loggers employer, as long as they're an active member and they become vested in loggers, those years that they worked um, for the state, they could purchase those four years or however many it may be um, towards their loggers benefit as well. So a couple different options there. Again, we do have um, a form available on our website that you can fill out if that's something that you're, you're interested in seeing the cost of doing that. And a lot of times we have folks that will just roll funds from another qualified retirement account um, to, to pay for those purchases. So those are the two options you have to increase your loggers benefit. Now certainly uh, many of our members have 
additional uh, retirement vehicles outside of their loggers, um, like an IRA or a 457 or something like that. Um, and, and certainly that is, um, is, is always an, another option if, if an employee is looking to augment their, their retirement um, savings. One of the last options that we're going to talk here about, we've kind of gone through all the different components of how we actually calculate the formula and all the different elections that employers can make, but one other election that an, an employer can make, and again, this is something that they can change um, from time to time, is, is how they're choosing to pay for the benefit. So when an employer comes to us and says, we want to provide loggers coverage to our members, um, we take a look at each employer's um, employee pool. So we're going to look at how many employees you have, how old are they, how much service credit do they have, what are their wages. We're looking at all those different things. We're looking at the level of benefits that the employer wants to provide. And each employer is assigned a unique cost based on a lot of different factors, um, some of the ones I've mentioned included. And what our actuaries do is they look at all these different things and they come back with a rate. And the rate is going to be unique to your employer. And that rate um, is, is how you pay for each month's benefits. It's how you fund the benefits so that when your employees get to retirement, their benefit is 100% paid for. Um, so you're making your monthly contributions every month um, as a, a percentage of your payroll. So whatever that rate is that we, we have uh, given you, as assigned to that employer. And each employee has the option to say, Whatever the rate is, we want to pay, pay the whole thing. Um, this is just something we want to provide to our employees. Uh, we're not asking them to, to put anything in on their own, um, out of their own paychecks. Employers who choose this option are what we call non-contributory, meaning that the employer, whatever that contribution rate is, they make the entire contribution to loggers. Now, a lot of employers say, you know what, we think this defined benefit is a really important benefit to provide our employees, but we need our employees to have a little skin in the game, or we can't quite get there, um, we can't work it into the budget 100% on our own, um, so we need a little help from the employees. And they have an option that's called contributory. And so what this means is that all full-time employees um, are required to contribute 4% of their gross wage to help fund the benefits. Now again, remember, if your employer has chosen to be contributory, every loggers eligible employee must contribute 4%. It is a condition of employment. It's mandatory. They don't have the option to elect in or elect out of it. So we talked at the beginning of the webinar about the definition of full-time employees and all of that. If they're meeting those requirements, um, that 4% that needs to be coming out of, out of their paycheck. I um, mean, it's helping to fund the benefit. Now, a couple things. Um, to remember about those employee contributions, and I'm going to come back to that slide here in just a second, um, is number one, those monies that each employee pays in go into an account with that employee's name on it, they earn interest, and our members are always guaranteed the money that they pay in out of their own paychecks, that's their money, um, and they are guaranteed to never receive back less than they paid in. Um, those contributions are made on an after-tax basis. Um, so if you're used to um, having um, something come out pre-tax um, where it's reducing taxable income, the logger's contribution looks a little different. It's not reducing taxable income now. Um, you're paying tax on it now. But when you receive it back in a retirement benefit when you retire, a portion of your monthly benefit um, at that time would not be taxable. Um, Kind of just going back here, though, between the differences between contributory and non-contributory, I like this example just to kind of illustrate um, the impact of this particular election on the employer's contribution. So like I said, if an employer is non-contributory and our actuary says 10% is what we need to fund your benefits, um, the employer makes the full contribution. If they elect to be contributory, um, the member has to put 4% in. It, it can't be 3%, it can't be 2%, it has to be 4%. And then whatever the difference is, is, is what the employer would pay. So in this case, it would be roughly 6%. Now generally, when an employer goes from contributory to non-contributory, the cost isn't a full 4%, it's somewhere around 
3.6 to 3.9%. And that's just because there's some turnover assumptions and some other actuarial assumptions that make it a little less expensive for an employer to do that. Um, from an employee standpoint, I think the most important thing about contributory versus non-contributory is it doesn't change the level of benefit that a member is receiving. So that monthly benefit at the end, this doesn't affect that. It just is affecting how we're funding the benefits um, each month. I did promise that we would talk about um, changing benefit levels. I want to talk briefly about upgrades and downgrades. The Benefit programs, final average salary, um, retirement ages, so that rule of 80, and contributory, non-contributory, all of those things that we've talked about are options that your governing body can change, either up or down, once every two years. Um, generally speaking, upgrades are going to mean higher contribution rates for the employers. Obviously, the higher the level of benefit, they're more expensive. Um, Subsequently, also upgrades will mean increased retirement benefits for all current employees. Um, so if you have folks who have already left your employer or who have already retired, um, upgrades or downgrades don't affect those folks. So they only affect your current employees. And the other thing that's kind of unique about upgrades and downgrades is that they are retroactive. And what this means is here we have an example of an individual who works 20 years at a lower benefit program. At some point in time, the employer makes an upgrade and works another five years at the higher benefit program. Because upgrades are retroactive, it is as if this employee always had the higher benefit program. So their benefit calculation will look something like this example here at the bottom, where we take the higher benefit program, in this case 1.5% times whatever their final average salary may be, times their years of service credit. Vice versa, an employer can also choose to make a downgrade. Um, again, this can be done once every two years. Typically, that is going to result in a lower contribution rate for an employer. Again, it only is going to affect your current employees. And furthermore, it only affects future service. So unlike the upgrades, benefit downgrades are not retroactive. State law protects our members' benefits at the highest earned level. So if you've worked for an employer at a higher level and they've been promising you a benefit um, at that level, state law protects that benefit that you've earned. They can't take that away from you at a later date. But they can decide the benefit that you earn going forward um, may need to be a little different. So in this example, it's, it's very similar to the one we looked at before. Um, I've just swapped my numbers around. An employee who works 20 years at a higher benefit program, employer makes a downgrade, works a little longer at a lower program. The way that we actually do these is we'll have two separate benefit calculations that we do. The 20 years that you worked at the higher program, here this top calculation, the 1.5% times the final average salary times the 20 years of service. Um, we do that one calculation, and then the years worked at the lower program would be our second calculation, so this bottom formula here. Whatever those two uh, formulas produce, um, we add those two benefits together, um, and, and that is the benefit that that employee receives. So the actual process to, to change benefit levels, number one, um, very similar to when an employer joins loggers, the first thing they have to do is, is request a supplemental valuation. Fancy word for a cost study. It basically is telling us this is the level we want to look at changing to. How is this going to affect our rate? So that's the first step. Each employer gets one free one of these each year. Um, our fiscal year runs from July 1st to June 30th. So that is when we say one free one a year, it's one free one per logger's fiscal year. Um, so if you requested one now, you wouldn't be eligible for another free one until next July. Um, you can always if you've gotten one and you want to look at another one, um, request additional ones at, at a, a fee, but you get one free one each year. The valuation, again, just like when you join, does have to be made public information for 45 calendar days. Um, a lot of our employers just place that in their meeting minutes that they discussed it and it's available for viewing. 
And once those 45 days have been satisfied, your governing body has to pass an ordinance or a resolution adopting the change. If this is something that you are interested in doing, um, the way that you can go about requesting one, if you are the representative of your employer, so if you're in human resources or you're on the governing body or you're the administrator of, of your employer, um, those are the folks that we kind of look to get these requests from. Um, not any employee can, can ask for those. Um, but if you're re representing your employer, uh, feel free. You can uh, shoot me an email, and we can, we can get that set up. We can talk about um, how, how to go about doing that. So um, my email address is, is um, available here with this presentation. I kind of want to close out um, this afternoon talking just a little bit about the survivor and disability benefits. So we've spent a lot of time already talking about the retirement component of loggers. Um, but one thing I think kind of gets overshadowed, and it's an, um, an excellent benefit um, in addition to the retirement component of loggers um, for our members, are the survivor and disability benefits. Um, so a survivor benefit would be um, what we pay to a survivor of a loggers member who passes away. And a disability benefit is something we would pay to a member who has uh, become totally and permanently either physically or mentally disabled from performing their current job. So not any job, but the, the current job that they're doing. And we classify survivor and disability benefits in, in one of two ways, either duty or non-duty. Um, non-duty related, um, either deaths or disabilities, uh, the first thing is that a loggers member has to be vested in order to receive this benefit. And the benefit is then calculated based on um, the amount of service credit that the member had earned to date. So if the member had 10 years, their benefit calculation, we use the same formula that we looked at earlier, um, would be based on the 10 years that they've earned. If it is duty related, the member number one does not have to be vested. Um, and secondly, we extend service credit as if that employee had worked until age 60. So if I were 40 years old and I had five years of service credit with my employer, and I went out on a duty disability, I would add an additional 20 years to my benefit calculation to get me up until, um, as if I had worked until age 60. Now our survivor benefits um, are paid, obviously, when, when there's a death, either duty related or non-duty, um, and loggers looks firstly uh, to pay survivor benefits to a spouse. The spouse receives a benefit based on option A, which option A is our highest spousal payout option that we offer. Um, and they receive the benefit again based on that same calculation um, every month for as long as they live. If there is no spouse, loggers will look secondly to pay to any dependent children. And we define dependent children as um, any individual under the age of 18, um, any child under the age of 18, unless continuously in higher education up until age 23. Now, dependent children will receive 60% of the member's benefit, and it is split equally among however many dependent children um, there are. Um, I get a lot of questions from folks, too, about, well, you know, I designated my, my brother on my beneficiary form. Um, will he receive any of these survivor disability benefits? The designation that members make on their um, beneficiary form are, are not for these survivor and disability benefits. State law is going to decide that it's either a spouse or a dependent child. Um, if there's no spouse and no dependent child, no further monthly benefit is payable. Now, if you have contributions in the system, that's where those beneficiaries that you designate on your um, membership forms is really important because we will refund um, those contributions plus their interest um, to, to um, whoever you've designated on those forms. So it's really important that, that all of our members keep those updated and on file. For the prospective members that we have with us today, we kind of talked about the process of, of changing benefit levels, and the process to membership is, is going to be very similar for you. First step is going to be to request that actuarial evaluation. It's that cost study we talked about. And once you have that cost study, it does have to be made public information for 45 calendar days. Again, a lot of our employers place this in their meeting minutes um, and make it available um, that way. And then after the 45 days has been satisfied, your governing body can make um, a resolution or ordinance to adopt a loggers membership. Certainly getting those cost studies doesn't obligate you um, to do anything, um, but it is the first step that we require in our membership process.
A um, couple more things here. I've got just a couple minutes before the end. Uh, that kind of concludes the um, 101 portion of our, our session. Um, if you haven't been to our new website already, I would really encourage you to go there. A few things that I'd like to just quickly point out here. Um, this MyLoggers is something that is so helpful for our members. Um, it allows each individual to log on to their own account. They can look at service credit. They can look at their wages. They can do benefit calculations. If you're interested in purchasing service, there's a calculator on here. Um, you can generate those benefit estimates, apply for retirement. There's tons of stuff you can do on here. If you've never been on my loggers, you just got to click this Enroll Now button, um, and, and you can get on there. Um, if you work in the HR for your employer and you're always having employees wanting to change beneficiaries or something like that, they can do that all online at my logger. So this would be a good place to point them. Um, we also have our social media pages. Uh, we really encourage you to get on there and join the conversation and talk about your retirement benefits and why it's important to you. Um, so we have just a lot of different resources um, out here online that we've um, kind of currently updated. I mean, those are all there for all there for your benefit. So uh, please, please check that out um, and, and take advantage of some of these resources that we have, have online for you. Uh, with that being said, if I don't have any further questions, I've got just a couple here I'm going to kind of follow up with individually. Um, I think I've shared everything uh, with the group that I've, I've gotten. Um, you can hang on the line if, if you've asked a question I haven't answered, but otherwise that's going to conclude um, the 101 today. Again, remember we do uh, hold these webinars monthly. Um, if you'd like to repeat a session, uh, feel free to um, check us out on our events page or we'll send those emails around that you, that you get every month from us too, reminding you so. I appreciate everyone's time.